All right, good to have you back again. In our previous video, we were looking at introduction to programming language. Over there, we saw what a program is. We saw what the um, saw various components like syntax, the semantics, and the grammar. We also looked at the difference between um, formal language and natural languages. So in this video, we consider various types of programming languages. Then let's proceed. So basically, um, programming languages are grouped based on the paradigm. We, or in other words, we're going to talk about um, the, the operation on how those programs were developed. So the, um, the ways in which these programs are being formed uh, determines the kind of um, classifications. For example, now uh, we have various um, buildings in our society, but sometimes we call, some call them bungalow, some call them duplex, some call them skyscraper, you know, and basically the name came about by the structures of those um, buildings. Likewise, in programming language classification, so when we call those names, it's as a result of the programming paradigm through which those programs were built, and this gives the programmer's view of the code execution. You know, that also forms the visual part of the code. And these uh, categories are classified into six. For example, number one, we have the object-oriented programming language, which we call the OOP. We have the structured programming languages. We also have the procedural programming languages. We have the functional programming languages. We have the data-oriented programming languages. We have logic-based programming languages. You know, basically now we have six classification, and under these six classifications, we'll be looking at what they are, and also example of languages that fall into these categories. Now let's look at the first example, the object-oriented programming language, that's the OOP. You know, basically that's the newest and the most powerful programming paradigm. When we say most powerful, in terms of dynamism, in terms of when you want to achieve any particular goal, you know, most, most of the uh, previous languages were limited on the kind of operations they can do. But with these um, OOP languages, um, we are giving this dynamic ability to build structures or to build any program of our choice. So we're no longer limited by the kind of things we're able to do. And with this OOP, it requires the, the only thing is that it requires the developer, that's the programmer, to specify the data structures as well as the type of operation to be applied on those data structures. You know, we won't talk about data structures, we're talking about a systematic way to store our data and, and for effective and efficient retrieval of those data. You know, when you want to store your data, like you have to specify this is, okay, this is an integer for the name, for the, for example, now we have the data structures, we have primitive type and non-primitive type, we have for primitive, we have the integer type, the float type, the real type, non-primitive, we have the arrays, the linked lists, uh, talk about the trees, the the graph, talk about the stack, the queues. You know, now you have to specify the particular one to use. So programming languages don't 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 demand the developer to specify that structure. They choose it by default, like those early versions. But this particular one like, gives you the room to choose that okay, for the name, let it be an integer value. For the math number, let it be uh, a string value. For, for the score of the student, let it be a real value. So you choose the kind of data structure, then ask the kind of operations that can happen. Maybe you want to do addition, or talk about the subtraction, you want to add, you want to transverse the data structure, you want to print. So these are the kind of operations come that can take place in those data. For example, now, when you upload student data, 
an operation that can perform is that it should allow people to transfer. In other words, they can only view those data from their net. They don't have they don't have the liberty to to alter the content except you give them the privilege. So when we talk about this type of operations, it means that you as a developer you have to specify if the user can modify the content or just view only. And again, what you have to know is that the, the, the pairing of the data and the operation can be done on it as a result of an object. You know, basically, those um, from the name object oriented, the programs were built as an object. So, in other words, there are modules, several, several modules that can interact together to form a particular program. And the programs, uh, we are made by a set of cooperating objects instead of an instruction list. Some programs, it's just, it just only about only um, instructions you keep typing and keep going. But in case of OOP, OOP, there are various objects or various modules or components that are being designed. For example, you build a calculator. One for an object is for addition, one is for subtraction, one is for division, one is for that. Then at the end of the day, these objects will be a cooperative. They will be, in, they will be communicating and they will be working as one. Because they are, because they are um, object oriented. An example of languages we have, we have a C sharp in that category. We have the object C plus plus. Then we have the Java. Then we have the Python. You know, among I think the most version, the most current is Python programming languages. So basically, with the C sharp, the object C C plus plus, it from normal C plus plus. Then the Java and the Python. That's for that. Then let's look at another example. Another example we're going to consider today is the structured programming languages. This one gives the programmer with additional tool to handle problems created by larger problems. Oh, we're trying to talk about structured programming languages, for example, you know, um, this language um, did not leave all the responsibility of the code to the programmer. No, it, it there are some built-in modules already within the system that you can always take to solve a big problem. For example, now you are trying to build a calculator, which is a big problem. So now you have a, a small module that can do addition into the system. So you take that. There's a small module that can do subtraction. So there's small, small tools that you can pick from the, from the, from the environment that enables you at the end, you're able to achieve a larger program, which is the larger problem. So those small, small tools that you have is what structured programming provides for you to achieve a, a bigger one. So with the small, small component that the system has, at the end of the by the time you integrate them, together, you're able to solve a people which is a calculator. Is that okay? Now, when using this program, so you are, required, you are required to cut out the program structure into small pieces of code that can be easily be understood. You know, we said this thing earlier, in what we were talking about the attributes of the programming languages. So they must be easily understood. So despite those small, small modules, if they're not clear enough, it's going to be difficult for someone to use. So the next example we're going to consider, okay, under this example, we have the C, we have the Pascal programming language, we have the ADA. ADA is also a programming language. It's not ADA from Anambra or from Imo State. It's an ADA. Is this Lovelace ADA is an inventor of any programming languages we have back then. So most proceed have procedural programming languages. This involves list of operations and the programs need to complete to be able to attain preferred states. Procedural programming languages. So in other words, there are list of operations it must complete. For example, if for, for example. When you say procedural, from the name procedural, so you, you should be able to do attain A, then be able to attain B, able to achieve C <clears throat> before it gets to D. But some programs are not like that doesn't work that way. Some components might be working, why some components are not working. But in case of these procedural languages, there is no how component B can be in operation without component A being well stated. 
So, 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 so this program has a starting phrase, the list of tasks and operations, then an ending state. For example, we saw in our in our flowchart, you know, say start, receive input, give us the okay, what to add two numbers, get input, after input, they will now say add the two numbers, then give us the, uh, the the output. So you must have the starting point. The list of tasks and operations are those operations that it must be able to complete before getting to the ending state. And we have, for example, an example in that part, we have the basic and Fortran programming languages. Basically, for this class, we'll be considering basic. So this part of code is what is used to achieve a goal. The one important thing again, I need to know that the procedural programming languages allows us to use a, a segment, a code segment over again without us having to replicate that segment. For example, now you have a segment to add two numbers at the middle, uh, you know, in the beginning. Then maybe you get to the middle and you want to add two numbers. You don't need to go and, to go and uh, rewrite that addition again. You can transfer procedure to the to to the to the to that portion where the addition module is. So can, a command can be transferred maybe from the middle to the beginning part. So once you make use of that code, then you can continue the operation. Then let's see another one, have, what have we called the functional programming languages. This, program, this particular programming languages uh, basically are functional languages. They define programs and sub-programs at mathematical function. Okay, just like we know in our mathematics, we have the YDS, we have um, uh, we have the integral of x. So all those things are also once you click on those function, it gives you the result. So now what we are talking about. So in this in this kind of case, instead of building those programs in terms of module, they define those programs and subroutines as a mathematical function. Basically, we have two functional programming languages that are not common. We have the SQL and we have the Miranda. Not the not the Miranda of Pepsi, the one that is made by Coca Cola, uh, made by Seven Up Company. No, we have a Miranda, and we also have the SQL programming languages. So they are basically the two example of functional programming languages. They also have another example called data oriented. You know, this one provides a strong way of session and manipulating the relations that have been described in an entity relationship table, which maps one set of objects to another. Basically, it's what we call entity relationship table. If, if you remember when we were doing foundation class, we talked about a um, database. I talk about an entity, talk about a relationship, talk about the tables. For example, now know what table it is, talk about know what's an entity. Basically, um, a student is an entity, a course in a school is an entity. So when you say a, a student is offering CSC 101, the relationship there is that it is 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 many to one or one to many. For example, now one course being offered by many students. So relationship between a student or with student with a particular course is one to many. But a relationship between a student and all the courses is offering is one to many. Sorry, a course, a particular course to students in a class is many to one. But a student relationship between a particular student to all his courses is one to many. So basically we have like SQL, we have the visual profox in that category. Then finally we have the logic based languages, for example, this will specify the attribute that the solution must have, rather than step by step to obtain a solution. Hear me again, it specifies the attribute that a solution must have, rather than the set of steps in other words, it, it is more focused on the characteristics of that solution and not the instruction. And that is why prologue, uh, prologue is basically used for artificial intelligence. You know, in artificial intelligence programming, we have the prologue, we have the list, and that of that. Then that's for that for that. Then in our next, next class, we'll consider uh, programming in basic proper. So I believe um, with this, 
uh, understanding, you're able to comprehend that which uh, the, the basic foundations you need to know about programming languages. Thank you for listening. See you in the next class.